I'm really thankful that in these last days of time, there are still people that are willing to make a stand and to do something for the Lord in this late hour of time, no matter what it costs. We're very privileged, as I said before, to have with us tonight Dr. Alberto Rivera, who has made this stand. He's an ex-Jesuit priest. Dr. Rivera, praise the Lord. Praise him. To him be the glory now and forever. Yes. What a wonderful thing to know and to see that as the days go by, prophecies are being fulfilled and the people of God are getting together. Yes. In preparation for the greatest event on earth and heaven, the great celebrations of the weddings of the Lamb. Certainly, for all that glory, the cross will be changed. But it takes us a little time. It will take us a little work to get there. And we should do it with honor and with joy. I have with me this evening a converted Roman Catholic nun. And this is one of the many nuns and priests that are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly, it pay off for even you to go and give a track to someone. The result, you will never see it entirely. Until we get to heaven, we will know what that track did in the life of many people. Then it pay off to serve Christ and be faithful to his church. It pay off to go as far as he called us to go, regardless of the cost, because we see these constant living testimonies as a result of the work and conviction of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. In the life of nuns and priests, more than generally speaking, in the life of Roman Catholic people, today, in response to all these imitations, that you see and watch in television. Many priests and many nuns and many different religious programs are going on. And people almost are persuaded to believe that these priests are truly Christians. People not only almost persuade to believe, people already believe. Of course, when someone believes that this is a reality in the life of a priest, they go back to the mass after the show was over and go back to the confession, and go back to the Pope, and go back to Mary, and go back to the saints, and go back to his rosary, then I will not only say that there is something wrong with that priest, but I will say there is something wrong with the people that believe that he could be a Christian. Then we have both sides, and God wants to respond to that in a very effective, powerful way as only God can do it. This testimony of Sister Ildwara Bamunde is one of the many that God is using as a response, the greatest and most powerful response to all these masquerade and imitation that you even watch in television going on today. The Lord is doing his work, there is no doubt. He takes his time too, you know. He lives in eternity. He takes his time, but when the time comes, then the world be better prepared. I would like for her to bring to you a briefing testimony of her conversion, and she is going to speak in Spanish. I'll try to translate into English, and then we will at least have an idea how many things uh, she's not going to be able to go in details of many things, but at least those who can listen in Spanish, she have the tapes of her testimony, complete testimony in Spanish, those can hear, and very soon she will have those testimonies in English too. But how many of you have read or hear of Sister Charlotte here in America, the conversion of an ex nun. Let me see your hands of those who have read or hear of the conversion of Sister Charlotte. Now, very few, 
But uh, for those who do not know or have not been able to read, that was unknown 50 years ago almost, and she was converted. And she was brought out of the convent, and they took her back again. After they catch up with her, they force her to go back because she was in a cloister, and a nun in a cloister cannot survive, cannot live outside of the convent. If she escaped and she do not go out under dispensation, as uh, called, then they will bring her back and keep her for the rest of her life under terrible punishment. They call flagellation, of course, is torch. But they give a religious terminology as flagellation of the flesh. That is torch. Our sister was placed under torch from her head down to her feet. She bear the marks of these torches that she received in the convent. When she was able finally to realize, not even saved yet, but even much before she was saved, as happened with me, as you can see throughout these experiences that I have related to you, that during these confrontations we did have this punishment because in many instances I cannot resist the idea of uh, speaking of the very things that I was being confronted by the Bible, by the Word of God. Then she have some reasons to speak up and they silence her with tortures and punishment until the day that she received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and she was free, entirely free. Now she is from Colombia. She has spent a great deal of time in the Colombian mountains and the Amazons regions reaching and teaching the Indian population in these areas as a nun. And there is where she received, through all these trials, she received the light of the gospel, and through the gospel she received the knowledge of her Savior, Jesus Christ. Allow me to introduce Sister Ilduara Bamunde, and she will <laughs> speak to you briefly. Dios les bendiga. Uh, mi nombre es Silduara Bahamundi. Yo soy colombiana y uh, sé que la mayoría pues hablan inglés, no hablan español. Pero en esta noche uh, para mí es de regocijo estar con ustedes y compartir alguna experiencia. Me he llenado de alegría ver un grupo de personas que dan testimonio del rescate de Jesucristo en este tiempo es una evidencia la salvación la realidad de un Cristo vivo para este tiempo mi experiencia fue en un convento durante 12 años y de allí me sacó el Señor estaba trabajando como monja misionera entre los indígenas la tribu de los indios ticunas en el Amazonas now, she went too far. <laughs> now, you, you were benefit, those who understood Spanish, but I'm going to be briefer than that. <laughs> now, you already hear her name, and she is praising God, because at the time that she arrived here among you, as happened with me, uh, she realized that truly the Lord Jesus Christ has been worshipped here, and has been honored here. And then uh, she blessed the Lord for that, knowing how you too has been delivered from the powers of darkness in many areas in your life. That is a thrilling experience because it reminds her from her own uh, experience what the Lord has done for her. As she mentioned, and I did mention, she was, by the time that she started now giving you uh, a brief testimony, uh, she started mentioning where and what area of Colombia she was working with the Indians. Cuando de, a la edad de nueve años uh, decidí ingresar al convento 
de siervas de la Madre de Dios uh, fue con una pregunta, con un propósito y el propósito era conocer la verdad. Uh, ya me habían respondido que la verdad estaba en la Santa Madre Iglesia. I was nine years old when that is the first stage of our experience. I was nine years old when I was inside, invite, persuade to go to a convent. And that is usually, and my own sister even went about seven, when she was seven years old. You can imagine what has happened in, the, in many centuries in the past when this was allowed to take place even under the laws of every country. Then, uh, when she was already nine years old, the question that brought her to the convent already was to find and search where was the truth. And she questioned the mother superior when she had the interview with the mother superior about where she can find the truth. Shall her find the truth there? She said, my dear uh, uh, girl, I can promise you, I can guarantee you that the truth is with our holy mother uh, church. Los primeros años que pasé en el convento eh, fue en una intensa búsqueda, buscando la verdad, buscando a Jesucristo. Jesucristo es realidad de salvación. Y si es verdad que está en un convento, entonces tenemos que sentirle en nuestros corazones, en nuestras vidas, sentir realidad, certeza, seguridad de salvación. Y pasaron ocho años, hice los votos temporales, hice los votos perpetuos de pobreza, castidad y obediencia. Y finalizando estos votos, hice estudios de teología y me di cuenta que mi religión estaba cubierta por un velo de falsedad. As I went into the convent and I was taken in 12 years later, I already took uh, my first vows and two different types of vows. One are temporal vows that you can be released from and then there are the uh, perpetual vows, the eternal vows that you can never be released from. Uh, it's the case of a priest that is ordained the same thing. Uh, he is ordained forever priest regardless whether he become a criminal, whether he commit the greatest immoralities or whatever, even if he quit, he is still a priest forever. We will talk about that later. In the meantime, throughout these 12 years, she went on and on searching for that very question, or that very answer of the question that brought her into the convent. Where is the truth? And actually, she went into further, deeper study as in her a case in her convent, not all the convents uh, take the same uh, measures and the same studies uh, that she was in, but throughout all this time she was already ordained or prepared as a nun after all the different steps in, that she had to take. Descubriendo que mi religión, la religión católica la cual profesaba, tenía un velo de falsedad, decidí entonces empezar a descorrerlo, empecé a buscar en la tradición y me di cuenta de cuántas cosas y cuántas invenciones hay en la tradición, mas cuando descubrí totalmente la tradición, entendí que había oído hablar de Jesús, pero no había conocido a Jesús y esta es una diferencia grande no es lo mismo oír hablar de Jesús que conocer a Jesús Amen. Uh, Throughout that time then uh, as a nun uh, she is targeting closer to discover uh, that already was kind and she used the term uh, veil uh, was a veil that will uh, stop her from seeking any further or searching any deeper or seeing any further that veil is as she put it is the tradition was the tradition it happened for her as a nun happened for me as a priest and and will for everybody even for any single roman catholic when uh, she uh, felt more need of christ than ever before that veil 
he will be there, he will be present. The, the, the manipulations of the traditions to a point that you could not go any further, even in your most urgent desires and needs about Christ, the person of Christ. She said the difference is that while she experienced the intellectual knowledge, is that idea, the intellectual knowledge about the name of Jesus, she could not conceive the person of Jesus. She could not embrace, she could not uh, be rescued by, she could not touch it. Uh, always was that intellectual idea of Christ, I have Jesus, but that is how far she was from him. Descubrí que el sacerdocio no era para este tiempo. El sacerdocio fue abolido con el sumo sacerdote, nos dice la escritura, nos dice la Biblia, que tenemos un solo sacerdote que traspasó los cielos y cuando fui a buscar el nombre de ese sacerdote, estaba segura que era el nombre que había en el Vaticano, en aquel tiempo Pablo VI, eso era lo que yo había aprendido, que ese era el nombre del sumo pontífice. Pero al ir a la escritura y encontrar en el libro de Hebreos capítulo 5, encuentro que el nombre del sumo pontífice no era Gregorio I ni Damaso I, pero sí era Jesús de Nazaret, oh, nos dice la escritura. As I went on and my need of Christ, I was brought to the uh, knowledge of the functions of the priesthood. And to me, uh, as a nun, as uh, it has happened for everybody else, uh, that particular person, that priest, was the closer saint to Christ. And then suddenly from the priest up to the Pope, he will be closer. It will be more real Christ according to that veil, that tradition. Of course, then I found that through the scripture, as I read Hebrews chapter 5, there was only one high priest, and that high priest was Jesus Christ himself and was in heaven. He was not in the Vatican. He was not Gregory the first or Damaso the first. He was Jesus Christ and is still being so. Yes. Uh, durante siete años, uh, de los primeros que estuve, en Romana, me enviaron para defender los santuarios que habían en nuestro país. Uno de los santuarios que fuimos a defender fue el santuario de la Virgen de la Salud. Era un altar levantado en honor a María e íbamos a defenderlo y por siete años perseguí a todo evangélico que llegara a ese pueblo y lo sacábamos del pueblo. Throughout a space of seven years, it took me not only to believe that, that there was the church that I was, but throughout the struggle of finding the truth, I became more desperate, but at the same time she became more militant because she was sent to protect the Catholic faith with other nuns into certain areas of Colombia where preachers, they were preaching the gospel. And every time that a preacher, a missionary went into these fields, these areas, then the bishops will call these nuns to their commons and will commission them through the mother superior to go into these places and get rid of these evangelicals, of these Christians, regardless of the cost and no matter how. They were there, as she put it, to defend, to protect the Catholic people from you know what, heresy, they said. Perseguimos a muchos evangélicos, dos, tres, cuatro, todos los que llegaron, pero tuvimos una experiencia. No somos uh, simplemente evangélicos, somos hijos de Dios. Y mientras perseguíamos y derrotábamos a todos los que llegaban con miedo, con temores, o buscando quizá la paz y confraternizar con las monjas, eh, descubrimos en medio de ellos a un hombre que sabía lo que significaba ser hijo de Dios y sabía dónde se había parado, sobre la roca. 
In the midst of that struggle in persecuting Christians, I found two differences. That not all those believers, that so-called believers and so-called Christians and so-called preachers and pastors and missionaries, they were not all. She could detect something was different because while others were trying to make peace with Rome, others were rejecting Rome to their very life and blood. She noticed that difference. There were some missionaries that at any cost they will make peace, they will find a place for dialogue with the priests and the nuns, and they will all be brothers and sisters. But she detected that, and she was not a Christian. Le quemamos su casa, lo hicimos meter a la cárcel, tratamos de comprarlo con dinero para que se uniera a nosotros, le persuadimos que éramos iguales, que predicábamos lo mismo, mas se paró con autoridad de Dios y nos dice, no predicamos lo mismo porque ustedes predican una institución para purgar las penas, mas yo predico a un Cristo que dice, justificado por la fe en Cristo Jesús, tenemos paz para con Dios. Praise the Lord. Man. As I noticed that difference, I went to see a man and I confront him. I faced him, and that was a very different one of all the evangelists and preachers and missionaries that I came across. Because when I spoke to that man, why he was not willing to keep the peace, and why he will not conceive the Catholic people as Christians and the Roman Catholic institution as a Christian church, he will said no, there is not such a thing. He said no, there is no way that we can make peace until you surrender to Jesus Christ. And there's only one way, and it's written here. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5. And he quote to her that through the word of God, he was commissioned and commandment only to keep peace, and people is called and invited to keep peace with God through Christ, not to compromises. Decidí a través de uh, la seguridad de este evangélico, de este hombre que les estoy hablando, decidí buscar y conocer al Cristo que este hombre tenía. Era el Cristo vivo, era el Cristo real. Y uh, durante una misa en el convento, quizá la última misa a la cual participé, la superiora general me dice, vas a escuchar y vas a participar en esta misa de corazón. Jamás había participado de esa misa, mas sabía que el libro de Hebreo dice que todo sacerdote está celebrando día tras día sacrificios inútiles que no pueden borrar tus pecados, pero Cristo, habiendo ofrecido una sola vez un solo sacrificio por el pecado, nos ha hecho perfectos para siempre. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, through this weakness, this truly Christian servant of Christ, uh, I became concerned about the words that he said from the scripture and many other uh, things that he transmitted and, and told me. And as the days went by, I was very picky from their own questioning everything that I did and, and questioning the Mother Superior and this is where my troubles started really with the convent through the reading of the scripture and through the testimony that I was receiving then I was called by the Mother Superior and after some times of penance and punishments uh, that she was going through some trials the Mother Superior recommend her to attend this Mass, there was a special Mass to be celebrated in the convent, and ask her to be there to recant from all her doubts and all of her insecurities about the Catholic doctrines. That she must, once for all, get rid of all these doubts about the Catholic institution, the Mother Church, as they call it. And that mass was prepared especially for that event. She must come there with that intention in her heart and make a public act of that intention. 
mientras estoy participando de la misa, me pregunto por qué si ese sacrificio se celebra en memoria de la muerte de Jesús, por qué si esa es la sangre de Jesús que está en la copa, por qué si el sacerdote tiene autoridad de convertir el pan en el cuerpo de Jesús y el vino en la sangre de Jesús, por qué en 12 años que llevo de monja no ha sucedido nada en mi vida, no tengo seguridad de salvación y siento que mi vida se está perdiendo a pesar de las cicatrices y las huellas que llevo en mi cuerpo al pagar silicios y penitencias por la salvación de mi alma. As I went deeper into this struggle, even during the time of the Mass, while the Mass was performed, a lot of questions rise up in my mind. And throughout the 12 years of nonary, as I can recall, I never have one single instance where I can be secure, I can have the security that my sins, my transgressions were washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. I came to know and I came to be aware that that mass being a bloodless mass, a bloodless sacrifice, you should understand, as I mentioned yesterday, that the mass, even so that the Council of Trent decree that is the, the body and the blood and the soul and the deity of Christ, nevertheless, is declared as a bloodless mass. And as she read in Hebrew, she could understand that it was needed a blood for remission of sins. Now, once that Holy Spirit brought her, her attention to that fact, she was there in that Mass looking for the real blood that will be able to wash her transgressions and sins away. But it was not there. Durante la misa hay una parte muy importante o considerada importante para ellos y se llama Salmo Responsorial. Generalmente se toma el Salmo Responsorial de la Escritura, de un Salmo. Cuando el sacerdote dice en la misa, vamos a leer el Salmo Responsorial de este día, toma el Salmo 15. Y cuando toma el Salmo 15, dice el Salmo 15... Señor, ¿quién entrará en tu santuario? Y cuando cada monja miramos el papelito que tiene la respuesta, encontramos que la respuesta es el de manos limpias y corazón puro. Mas yo miro mis manos y están sucias, sucias de idolatría, y mi corazón no está puro porque hay raíz de amargura. That is when not only questions arise more and more often, but there is when my decision start getting close to find out that the heaviness of my transgressions and sins were crying loud for forgiveness that I could not receive, for peace that I could not have. And this came to be known especially by the priest that was performing the Mass reading Psalm 15. And you can see in different ways how the Holy Spirit used different messages in the scripture to bring about that needed conviction of every person. And while at there she was in the same mass, the priest that was reading Psalm 15 will say, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walk uprightly and work righteousness and speak the truth in his heart. He that bite it not with his tongue, nor doth evil to his neighbor, nor taken up a reproach against his neighbor. As he went on, conviction was coming to her from the Lord, knowing that no the priest, not her, were forgiven or redeemed by Christ at all. They were all sinners there. They were all stained with their sins and transgressions, and they were professing Christ the one that could wash away all those transgressions and sins. A través de la escritura del Salmo 15, recuerdo y sé por qué soy idólatra. La Biblia en el libro de Éxodo 20 nos dice, 
no te harás imagen de ninguna cosa que esté arriba en el cielo ni abajo en la tierra no te inclinarás a ella ni la honrarás porque yo soy Jehová tu Dios fuerte y celoso entonces a través de esto descubro que si mis manos están sucias si mi corazón está impuro si soy idólatra si tengo dioses ajenos jamás entraré al reino de los cielos porque lo dice la escritura There is how she conceived the word tabernacle in that song. She said that immediately she brought to her memory Exodus chapter 20, among others, the scripture as she went through these experiences, and she conceived that if only those who have their hands clean can be in the tabernacle, then that means the kingdom of heaven. There she conceived that she was not in the kingdom of heaven. Her hands were filthy. Her heart was filthy. The priest's heart and hands, they were all filthy. Who then could stand before the Lord? Who then, from all then, could enter the tabernacle, the kingdom of heaven? Now, as she was reminded by the Holy Spirit, she will be brought to the fact that she become as uh, they all were idol worshippers. They have uh, statues, they have images, and she was looking around that very moment that this message of Exodus 20 was brought to her mind under the Holy Spirit conviction, that she could see that God was giving her, offering her all these signs and evidence and proofs around her that she was not what he would like her to be. Fue en ese momento que por primera vez oré, todos los 12 años de monja había rezado, no es lo mismo rezar que orar, rezar es repetir, orar es hablar con Dios. Y oré por primera vez a un Dios que no conocía, mas oré con humillación de corazón y Él me escuchó, Él me respondió. Le pedí a Dios y dije, Jesús de Nazaret, no te conozco, mas quiero conocerte, quiero que te reveles hoy a mi vida. He recibido migajas como monja, mas necesito vida y vida en abundancia. Y pude experimentar en ese día que Jesucristo es real y que da vida en abundancia a quien clama a Él. Amén. Yes, as these experiences were taking place, then... I remember for the first time in my life that there I could not resist, I could not wait no longer, I called upon the name of God and for the first time I did pray nor the rosary, not a reading prayer, but now from my heart I want to speak to God and God alone. Then she called upon the name of the Lord and she knew that anyone that called upon his name can be saved. That is where the blessings start pouring out from heaven. Durante los uh, primeros años de monja, había intentado ayudar a muchas personas y teníamos un centro para uh, jóvenes adictos a drogas y alcohólicos y también trabajamos con prostitutas tratando de ayudarlas y tratando de sacar eh, la raíz de amargura o el problema que las había llevado a dicho vicio, intentamos hacerlo, mas ahora en esa misa recordaba que no lo había logrado y que así como yo no lo logré, necesitaba un ser supremo que lo hiciese con ellas y lo hiciese conmigo para poder tener seguridad de recomendar a un Cristo vivo. Certainly that this is a paradox what you are going to hear and what you most of you perhaps already know that the clergy live this daily and Roman Catholic people are witness and actually everybody witness the fact that they were so dedicated and she went into during these days of a struggle she uh, went to other areas of work where she was helping the rehabilitation of drug addicts, alcoholics, 
prostitutes and runaway kids and so on. And uh, there she was in the midst of all these problems, of all these horrifying experiences in the life of men and women as well. And there she was with nothing to give and nothing able to do in favor of these very needed people. All what brought upon her was more difficult, more anxiety when she was surrounded by all these other experience and trying to help people without not only the knowledge but the power of a living Christ. Me pregunté con desesperación, ¿dónde está mi Dios? ¿Dónde está el Dios que busco? ¿Dónde está el Dios de los sacramentos? ¿Dónde está el Dios que le prendo velas? Mas parece que no me respondía. Pero en ese instante estaba clamando, había incertidumbre, clamaba al Dios de la capilla, más clamaba al Dios del cielo, y si me humillaba, el Dios del cielo respondería. This was the time that uh, suddenly I became more uh, aware of the need of more communication with the truly living God while I was uh, still calling upon the false God. Uh, I don't know what to do, what to go. The confusion was already there dealing with the matter of light and darkness. And she could uh, uh, see that she cannot offer to nobody, to no one, not even herself, anything because she was more persuaded than never before that every time that she did try to offer something or to help someone, she was unable, she was not really at peace about what she was given or offering in order to help and service. Uh, dije, Cristo, no quiero más engaños, no quiero más mentiras, necesito que te reveles hoy a mi vida, mientras el sacerdote levantaba la hostia, la partía en tres pedazos y decía, este es el Cordero de Dios que quita los pecados del mundo, mas yo quería saber cuál de los dos era el Cordero, cuál de los dos tenía la razón, quién me respondería en ese instante. I cried again and again throughout the process of that Mass, and again I went back and I said again, Lord, Lord, help me to know what is going on. I, I need you. I need to know you. And there is, in that very moment that I cry again before the Lord from the deep of my heart, so needed of peace and life. There the priest took the host in that moment, break it in three pieces as usual, that is the part of the liturgy is broken in three pieces. The big host that you see all the time is very symbolic, that uh, act. Then at the time that he broke it, and he said, there is the Lamb of God that take the sins of the world away. And she already questioned that. It was enough light already to question. Because her struggle, as you can see, was due to the fact that she could not trust in the Lord at the same time that she could not trust in what she had going through as a Roman Catholic nun. Now, that was another evidence that the Lord was given to her. By the time that that priest brought that idol, that some God, before her eyes, and mentioned that that horse was the Lamb of God. He will not say this is the symbol, or this is, uh, he said, this is the Lamb of God that take the sins away. Then she knew there was a time now for her to take a decision. It's in this moment uh, cuando paso a la fila de la comunión donde vamos a participar de la comunión y uh, estoy pensando y estoy pidiendo a Dios 
que me hable audiblemente, necesito escuchar su voz, necesito un milagro, necesito que se revele a mi vida y cuando el sacerdote humedece la hostia en vino y la lleva a mis labios, es como si se oyese un trueno, es como si la tierra temblase, empiezan todos a temblar en el lugar, cuando Dios habla, tiembla la tierra, tiembla Amén. el hombre y corre Satanás y en ese instante cuando el sacerdote va a llevar la hostia a mis labios, esa hostia no llegó a mis labios, cayó al piso y se partió en pedazos, mientras una de las monjas va a recoger las harinas que quedan de la hostia, entonces el sacerdote deja derramar el vino, con su lengua recoge lo que para él es la sangre de Cristo, y yo escucho una voz que traspasa mi vida, la voz de Dios que me dice, Hilduara, esa no es mi sangre, mi sangre fue derramada una sola vez, escapa por tu vida y salí corriendo del convento. Then uh, something happened, it happened so much that I myself, uh, I, I'm letting her preach here. <laughs> Now she has been blessed and, and remembering the very things that happened. By the time that that prayer finally took hold of the the end of the ceremony and a star given the host she approached the altar and there was the tremendous manifestation of God in such a way that she could almost hear the voice of God she could she could hear God speaking to her in a loud voice by the time that she was there to receive the host and was ready to get the host in her mouth It suddenly something happened. That horse fall to the floor and could not reach her lips, no, much less her tongue. The horse fall, everybody look, and that desperation came where all the nuns all around that were there in the chapel, immediately they went over, they rushed to the altar, and every nun, every priest kneeled down and started with their tongues cleaning the floor to get every piece of the cost. They were desperate. They were like a demons going over with their tongues over the floor. See, that is what is commanded by the consuls of the institution. That is how people become to believe that that is truly the body of Christ. Then she witnessed all, but she could not go down. If something was restraining her. And there's no doubt that in his mercy and his love, God already was not only given testimony to her of his love, but to all those who already were so blind and so drunk of what was taking place. No me era permitido, como uh, había hecho votos de pobreza, castidad y obediencia hasta la muerte, a esto se le llaman votos perpetuos, no me era permitido salir del convento sin pedir la dispensa de los votos y uh, en ese momento no me importó nada, era Jesucristo quien me mandaba y me decía, escapa por tu vida ahora y salí corriendo, trataron de alcanzarme en la puerta del convento, en la puerta de la capilla, mas cuando Jesucristo te ha alcanzado, por más que Satanás te corra, no te alcanzará. Certainly, that in that very moment, I felt, not only I hear, but I felt that God's presence was helping me to quit in that very moment, right there. In the midst of all these happenings, she felt taken and forced to walk and run, and she did. She ran out the convent, and she escaped. She knew that God was given command to go and to go out, to come out, right there, without any moment to wait for. And she left. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. The, Lord. the intention was to introduce her and to give you a very brief idea of what the Lord has done for her. 
and have her one entire evening here, perhaps Sunday. As we were not able to work out yet the program, I believe that in case there is no time to work out her return here Sunday, I feel and I know that the Lord will be pleased if I postpone for tomorrow the third part of our prophetical seminar until tomorrow and we go on with her testimony. Siempre me habían dicho que con Roma no se peleaba y al salir del convento traté de buscar a mis padres, era bien joven aún y busqué a mis padres, mas mis padres no me recibieron porque era la traición del hogar. Tuve que salir también de mi hogar y busqué un trabajo, mas no tenía los diplomas, las certificados los cuales había estudiado y solamente estaban en el convento, mas no me los darían para que no consiguiese empleo, para que tuviese que volver al convento rendida, humillada y supiesen lo que un hereje pasa cuando trata de pelear o trata de traicionar a Roma. Yes. This is very common, it's very popular, that a priest or a nun can leave the institution any time that they please, especially today with all the goodwill that the Vatican is trying to show even the very Christians. Then it used to be different years ago. Before they left, they could get killed. Now, uh, today they can leave as they wish, but under what they call dispensation. And even so, when dispensation is given, all diplomas and doctors and master's degree, all what you have earned through all these years is retained by the institution and is not given to you. What that means is that you go out, that common, that monastery, that parish, looking for a job and you have nothing to show that you know what you are saying that you know because you have nothing to show. You have no diplomas, no certified, nada, nothing. They retain every single document until they know how you behave outside. If they know that you behave well with the institution, they will give it through a lot of negotiation. They will give it. But in her case, they already knew she could not have her documents and she could not go back for fear that they will retain her. Not only retain the document, retain the person. It happened with Sister Charlotte and other nuns and priests in the past. It happened with me too. Now, then she could not get all the documents that were needed and there she was in society, not knowing what to do, not even knowing how to work. Lo primero que dicen cuando uh, una monja sale de un convento o cuando toma la decisión de escaparse es que está loca o está enferma mental y esto fue lo primero que se dijo a mis compañeras lo que se comentó en todo el pueblo uh, más tarde fue un detective del F2 de la policía en Colombia y la superiora general fueron los dos al lugar donde yo trabajaba y con una carta uh, certificada de una clínica de reposo me llevaron a aquella clínica de reposo porque estaba perturbada mental y allí estuve durante un mes hasta que encontré a un psicólogo cristiano que clamó a Dios para que me rescatara y me sacara de este lugar y pidieron un diagnóstico a través de otro médico de la calle que no fuese jesuita. Al dar el diagnóstico encontraron que no estaba enferma mental, que había sido llevada a este lugar para comprobar que estaba loca o enferma de la mente. Now, God did something very great, marvelous for her, among other miracles, is the fact that even so, when they were able to get hold of her, they were able to bring her back, but that was still a little bit too late to take her life. What they did was different. What they did, as happened to, it happened to be with my own experience, it was too late because already some of the things were being known even to the authorities how she escaped. 
then she was taken with help of the local authority to a psychiatric clinic because the mother superior had a stay that the reason why it happened to her what happened was because she was mentally disturbed. There was no problem in the company with her. There was no torture, there was no punishment, because that already she was confessing and telling and showing all the signs and marks that she had in her body. He said, no, 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 this is, is she, she is mentally disturbed, and this is what has happened. Then they consider this, and they put their own psychiatrics. And of course, these psychiatrics, they all were Catholics, and they said, yes, she is very bad. She must be re uh, retained. She cannot go out. Then uh, uh, suddenly, by the providence of the Lord, she was given the opportunity to be treated upon request of some of the uh, local authority with others. They just happened to ask for that. They said, well, let's get the test under some other psychologist and let's get some other psychologist that uh, see her before we decide the final action. And it happened to be that that man, that was a psychologist, uh, he was a Christian. And when he knew what has happened, and I'm glad to hear that he himself was not dependent even in psychology. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> a Christian psychology should never depend in psychology. <laughs> yes, you better believe this. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and if he's a psychiatric, he better get get healed. <laughs> yes, uh, you're going to find a lot of surprise these days with Christian psychiatrics and uh, psychologists. Then it happened that that was one of these men, and it happened that God showed that great mercy that he always is ready to show. Then she was taken to that man, and that man certified that there other, the psychiatrist and the other that treat her, they were wrong, and he proved it before a court. Yes, praise the Lord. Hay una desventaja en uh, mi país, en Colombia, y es que todavía sostiene el concordato, un pacto de paz entre la Iglesia Católica y el Estado. Y después de salir a uh, de sacarme de la clínica de reposo tenía que volver al convento para un juicio, mas yo me negué a hacerlo y pusieron una demanda, a esta demanda se había puesto por estafa, decían que yo había estudiado en el convento de siervas de la Madre de Dios y no había trabajado para dicho convento, me había salido antes de culminar el trabajo que debía rendir y por eso me demandaron por 80 mil pesos colombianos o regresaría al convento o iba a la cárcel. They fail in that attempt, but they work out another and they keep on working all the time. Then when they fail this, then the hierarchy of the Catholic institution plot another play accusing her of owning the convent over 80,000 Colombian pesos, I don't know how many dollars will be, but quite a few thousand, and then the authorities said, why? What she did, what she took money, she, they said she broke her contract. She was here in the convent to fulfill this contract for so many years and this particular job in education and she had broken and owned us that much money because that work was not performed. Of course, you have to understand that this, before a court in the United States today, it will have no validity, but it will in the future, after a concordat is being signed by President Reagan. Because this is some of the articles of a concordat between the Vatican and a government where they could said, when we request your assistance, you have to give us, you cannot deny our petitions. On these agreements, we, they base, they have certain laws, certain articles, certain rules, that the government must respect in cases of confrontation with their clergy and their people. 
and that was the case when the decision was brought to court, the concordat between Colombia, the government of Colombia, and the Vatican is show up in favor of the Vatican, accusing her of a crime that she never committed. Al decirme, o oh, la cárcel, o oh, el dinero, o oh, vuelves al convento, uh, recordé las palabras bíblicas donde dice, el reino de los cielos se hace fuerte y solamente los valientes lo arrebatan. Decidí entonces hablar con el capitán y dije, prefiero ir a la cárcel antes que al convento, porque en la cárcel tendré libre expresión, seré yo misma, Podré ser cristiana, mas en el convento no podré conocer a Cristo. Así que llévenme a la cárcel. They gave her three alternatives. As she stood before the court, the three alternatives were one, jail, to be incarcerated. Second, if she do not want to be incarcerated, she must pay these eighty thousand dollars that convent was claiming from her. E even she could have another alternative. No jail, no payment, but the final alternative was what they were expecting and hoping for, to have her back in the convent to finish the job, they said. Actually, they were the ones that will finish the job, you see. Uh, me llevaron a la cárcel. Y al estar en, en el dispensario o el lugar donde uh, decidirían si me enviarían a la cárcel de mujeres 72 horas después, entonces el capitán me llama para tratar de convencerme que regrese al convento, pero cuando le digo que no estoy dispuesta me dice tiene siete años de cárcel, hay una demanda por estafa, no podemos probar lo contrario y estás perdida. En ese instante es como si alguien hubiese iluminado mi mente, mas le dije a él, no estoy perdida, quien está perdido eres tú, estás violando la ley de mi país, estás mezclando leyes civiles con leyes eclesiales, porque si el concordato dice que no se pueden mezclar leyes civiles con leyes eclesiales, no entiendo por qué tú como ley civil me estás juzgando a mí como perteneciente a la ley eclesial. There came uh, the moment that uh, she must decide and she did it in the name of the Lord. She remembered the, the words of the Lord Jesus when he said the kingdom of heaven. Uh, what is that expression in English? Uh, so the kingdom of heaven become uh, a strong and you must fight and you must be brave and you must obtain it uh, that way. You cannot just uh, watch it like a spectator and see what a beautiful kingdom is, you see. In order to really know the kingdom of heaven, you must enter and you must struggle to enter. Then you must be brave. Then she was comforted by this word of the Lord and she said, I prefer to go to jail because in jail I will be able to witness are the very things that I don't know yet. And she was not yet as safe when she had been encouraged to take that decision and that step. The Lord was training and preparing her through on the tremendous trial. Then suddenly they said, well, uh, we want to take you to jail right now. They took it and they have 72 hours for a person to be in that particular place and then as a woman they will be translating her from the general jail that is called to the prison, woman prisons. And during these two 72 hours transition, a captain from the police came to see her. And as, uh, of course I'm sure that he was uh, sended by the ecclesiastical authorities and telling her before you are transferred I want to give you an opportunity. I'll take you back to the convent right from here. Nobody will know nothing. Nobody will say nothing. I'll take you with me back to the convent and everything is over. And then she said, no, I think I'm going to stay here. Then he went and quote 
and said, don't you see that you are committing a serious crime, not only against the civil laws, but against your church. And he started dealing as an official with religious matters. And he was getting very involved, deeply involved. You can see how much of a commission he had to carry on as a good Catholic, that suddenly he caught him in that dilemma and told her, do you know that you seem to be performing a better job for the institution, for the clergy, for the government, and for the civil laws? You see, you are placing the ecclesiastical laws above the civil law. He was very upset when she mentioned this. Decidieron entregarme entonces al clero y me llevaron a una ciudad apartada. Allí estaba la superiora general del convento, estaba el cardenal, estaba el obispo, varias monjas y sacerdotes de toda la diócesis. Se haría un juicio primero entre ellos y empezaron con preguntas. La superiora general me pregunta, ¿por qué te has convertido a esos? Mas le dije, no me he convertido a esos, mas me he convertido a Jesús. Amen. No es lo mismo convertirse a los evangélicos que convertirse a Cristo. By this time, I have approached, during these moments that I have approached, a closer relationship. That was the moment when finally I was questioned. You can see that there are many, many details that we, we, uh, she is trying to jump uh, as, as much as he can. There are many details here, but during this period, they try another thing. She was not yet in, in full time in the federal prison when already another news arrived. And the news was that she was being released. That shows you the degree of confusion and fear that the entire institution go from time to time. God place her under judgment. One single individual can cause her tremendous nightmare, tremendous nightmare. Some people say this is why I'm doing so much trouble, causing a lot of trouble. Now, she already was in that position and they knew there was trouble coming. Then before she get in touch even with people in jail, in the prisons, they even fear that. Then they release her to bring her before an ecclesiastical tribunal. And of course that is your inquisition that you believe that already disappeared, but is still at work 24 hours around the clock. Now, when she appeared before the tribunal, it was made up, as all inquisitions tribunal, made up of the clergy. There is no civil person there. It's only clergymen that occupy as judges and what you call the jury as well. Then there she was, and there were bishops and nuns and priests uh, according to their different office, and she was before that trial now. Viene una segunda pregunta. Uh, el propósito del juicio es hacer preguntas uh, a través de la tradición para que yo la responda según la experiencia que he tenido ahora. La segunda pregunta que me hace la superiora frente al cardenal es ¿Por qué tú dices que María no es mediadora? Mas le respondí, no soy yo, lo dice la escritura. Dice la Biblia, hay un solo Dios y un solo mediador entre Dios y los hombres, Jesucristo hombre. Praise the Lord. Yes. Uh, there came two questions of the first, and one question is why you were converted, why you felt that you need to be converted to these Christians and these evangelicals, they will say, these Protestants, these heretics. Then she said, no, I was not converted to them. I was converted to Christ. And they said, well, uh, if that is the case, then let me ask you this. And they went to the traditions because the way that they can finally judge her not only but condemn her will be by finding her guilty of breaking the canon laws that support and protect the tradition of the Roman Catholic institution. 
This way, still they're under a concordat between government and the Vatican. They can still charge in her with all kind of felonies, you name it. They can build up and fabricate hundreds of them. This was the purpose of that trial, to a tremendous interrogatory under the tradition that to see whether she will quote the scripture against the tradition and so forth. Continúan las preguntas, eh, tales como, ¿por qué niegas la Deidad de María? ¿Por qué dices que no fue Pedro el primer Papa? Y preguntas las cuales había que responder a través de la Escritura. Siempre eh, terminaba la pregunta diciendo, es Cristo Jesús, no hay otra alternativa para el hombre. La superiora general entonces decidió que me tomaran una silla y me ataran en esa silla y me vendaran los ojos para ver si era tan valiente como pretendía ser. The second question that came after, among other questions that I will arrive about Peter, about uh, saints, about confession, everything. The second question that made them very upset was when uh, they said, do you deny that Mary is a meditator? Then she said, yes, I do deny that she is meditator because the Bible teach me now there is only one meditator. It doesn't say two. It doesn't say only one meditator between God and men. And this is Jesus Christ, the man. Praise his name. Yes. Después que uh, me ataron en la silla y me vetaron los ojos, la superiora dio a una de las monjas unas pinzas, uh, como unos alicates, y me dicen, vamos a hacer esto, esto se hizo en la Santa Inquisición, te has rebelado contra el romanismo, has traicionado a las siervas de la Madre de Dios, y hemos reunido a todas las los sacerdotes y monjas de la diócesis necesitamos que ante ellos tú reniegues y digas que te han convencido unos evangélicos para que tú entraras a ser evangélica necesitamos que digas que el Cristo que ellos profesan no es real necesitamos que digas que tú no eres cristiana que tú no te has convertido a los evangélicos que simplemente trataron de comprarte mas cuando viene la superiora y me dice niega a lo que te has convertido le dije no podré negar porque no me he convertido a cualquier cosa más mas me he convertido al Cristo viviente, quien dio su vida en rescate de la mía. As you can see, during this trial, they brought a lot of priests and nuns that they could witness, precisely as, as a matter of simple in her life, what was about to happen. And to show you the dimensions of realities about Inquisition, this is one of the many samples that I, I'll be able to show you some other times, is today, in modern day, they, the trial already went on and on, and finally it went over, and they sentenced her. Uh, after the sentence already, the punishment was to be applied right there. That is the procedure of the Inquisition. They do not say, we're going to punish you later, or we're going to send you back. Right there, after a person is made guilty and is sentenced, the sentence starts right there before the tribunal. And that means part of the tortures they use start right there. And they use certain instruments to start the punishment. Uh, one of them is like a pins, uh, a, some kind of a instrument that uh, it will be uh, used to uh, start taking hair one by one. That is a part of the punishment uh, among others that will be listed and she won't have time to even list them all. Uh, estamos para terminar casi. Empezó a sacar a los cabellos de mi cabeza con las pinzas, más me decía, renuncia ahora, estás a tiempo. Seguía arrancando el cabello y tienes cinco minutos, renuncia a lo que te has convertido y continuaba. Al fin yo me desmayé por el dolor 
y la cabeza estaba en carne viva, todo el cabello había sido sacado, mas cuando desperté, después de ser encerrada en la sala de clérigos acusados, descubrí y estaba llena de gozo porque me arrancaron el cabello, mas no negué a Jesús. Yes, as the punishment star, you know, as I go and she go, I myself, I cannot resist the, the emotion and to know that I witness many of the things and many other horrifying things. And um, <laughs> in many of these acts that I brought myself, uh, being a Jesuit priest, I was the accuser. She was brought, kneeled under the tribunal, and they start punishing her. And believe it or not, the entire hair of her head was taken out of her scalp as she was bleeding all over. The process continued all hours and hours as she was bleeding to the point that she could not resist the see the blood coming over they would not allow her to clean her face or anything and then she faint and she f was taken finally after she was awake up all bleeding all the blood dripping and drying in her clothes then she was there by herself in a special room they call for the punish uh, clergy uh, and there she was by herself there to reflect as they expect that they will reflect and they will recant before they take them or take her to another step of punishment. It's just a transition time waiting and expecting that that will be enough for her then to recant and reject. But she said that right there the greatest joy of her life came to be known to her when she knew that she now have the strength and the love because she said she would not experience hate but the love and the peace of Christ. Yes, praise the Lord. Es posible que al escuchar este testimonio uh, también tú pienses y hayas sufrido mucho hayas tenido experiencias negativas mas estoy segura como lo estuve en aquel momento, no me importaba en ese instante que me matasen, que me quitaran la vida, no me importaba lo que hubiese que sufrir, porque sabía que al fin se había acabado aquel sueño de dogmas, de liturgias o de penitencias, mas ahora tenía vida nueva en Jesús. Y como dice Pablo, ni la muerte, ni la persecución, ni la tortura, podrán apartarme del amor de Cristo. Si en esta noche tú estás aquí con un propósito, buscando paz y seguridad en Cristo, no te has equivocado del lugar porque Jesucristo es presencia. Amén. Yes, as she realized there, in that very moment, in that very time, in that very place, is when she realized the greatest manifestation of her salvation in Jesus Christ as she trusts him and she wait upon him and she embraces him. Actually, uh, if you are here this evening, she said, is my invitation to you that you come quickly to him. Uh, there is no waiting period. When you know that you need him, then all what you have to do is just realize that you need him and have him, have it him now. Then as we stand up, uh, that is your invitation and it's up to you to decide this evening whether you will give to your life to Christ, your Savior and Redeemer, and whether you will realize that all the sufferings on earth could never be compared with how much he suffered for you when he took your place, not his place, your place, when he suffer in your place for you. Now, remember this. There is no time to waste. You should do it quickly. As you are, as you feel, come now, come forward, right now.
come forward, walk out, come out. And said, Lord and Master, I receive thee as my Lord and Savior. Come now. You need him? Now is the time. Supply the need. He can do it. Come out. Come forward. And we will be here with you as he will come to you. In an act of faith, you can receive him as your Lord and Savior. This is the opportunity. The word of God said, come out of her, my people. If you want to give evidence and prove that you are a child of God, then show it. Show it. Give it. You cannot do it by tradition. You must do it by faith and faith alone. See? Now, you must be reminded again, justify by faith. Justify by faith. And faith alone will bring you in peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come forward. Come out. Come out of her. You must come out. If you are not in Jesus Christ, if you are not a born again person, if you are not a child of God, you are a child of the devil. There is no doubt. You must decide this evening what you want to be from now on. You have been given evidence, not just the message, but you have been given evidence, signs of the message. That is good enough. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is compassionate. He show his compassion and his love to show you and her life what he is able to do and perform. Come to him now this evening. As we do pray, I ask you to pray. In a minute, we will finalize this invitation. You come forward. If you're still insecure, go ahead. Call upon the name of the Lord. He'll give you all the security you need now. Call upon his name. Anyone that calls upon his name shall be saved. Call upon his name now and give testimony, public testimony, that you have received him and he has received you this evening. Praise the Lord. And you who have come forward, say this prayer and say it unto the Lord. Say with all your heart, repeat it after me. Say it to the Lord Jesus Christ and mean it from the very depths of your heart. Repeat after me. My Lord and my God, have mercy on my soul, a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I believe that he died on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of all my sins. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Wash all my sins away in the precious blood you shed for me. You will not turn me away, Lord Jesus. You will save my soul. I know because your word, the Bible, says so. Lord, I know that you've heard me. And I know that you've answered me. And according to your own word, I know that I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. And raise your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Savior. Hallelujah. Praise the Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord and Master. Thank you, Father God, for these souls, Lord and Master, that you've sent forward here tonight. Pour out your strong spirit upon them. Give them a sincere desire to pick up the cross and to follow after you. Lord, to accomplish something for God these last hours of time. Pour out fear on their souls, Lord and God. Give them strong leading and guidance in the Holy Spirit, Lord and Master. We thank you for this service, Father God. 
We thank you for the testimony of your servants that you sent here, Lord and Master. Build a supernatural wall of fire round about the both of them, Father God. Protect them, lead them, and guide them, Lord and Master. Bring them back here safely tomorrow, Lord and God, to minister the word, Lord and Master. We thank you tonight, Father God, for pouring out your spirit here, for convicting these souls, Lord and God, for saving these souls, Lord and Master, for touching each and every heart here, Lord and God, with this testimony, Lord and Master. We praise you. We thank you for it, Lord and God. Father, bless the food this evening. Bless the hands that prepared it. Bless each and every Christian in the world, Lord and God, that's doing our work for the Lord these last hours. Lord, pour out supernatural boldness on all your servants throughout the world today, Lord and God. Supernatural walls of fire everywhere, Lord and God. We'll praise you for it, and we'll thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone here says, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed.